That was great. Thank you, mother and daughter. Come home to Jesus. That's what the song is really about. He's calling you. Come home. He's, uh, he's where you belong. He's the one that made you. And he's calling you back to himself because human nature is we've left him and wandered away from him. Turn to Genesis chapter 47 again, please, with me in your Bible. Genesis chapter 47. You're turning there. I want to just uh, share a couple of uh, thoughts from a proverb that I was reading, and it said, and it just uh, just hit me. Wow, <laughs> that's very descriptive. In Proverbs chapter ten, that chapter begins like this: "A wise son maketh a glad father." But a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Same chapter, verse 5. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. Well, I thought, you know, those two verses are a great summary of Joseph, especially chapter 47. He is a wise son. And he must have made his father very joyful. You know, let me just begin like this. And you answer this in your own heart. Are you, are you making your parents glad by the wise following of Jesus? Or are you causing them to be ashamed because of perhaps selfish and sinful choices that you're making. Are you a wise child or a foolish one? By Joseph's wise administration, right in the middle of a severe famine, God's people were living well. They were prospering. Look at verse 6 in this chapter and a couple of other verses that really prove this out. The land of Egypt he says, is before you, this is the king speaking, in the best of the land, make thy father and brethren to dwell in the land of Goshen, let them dwell. And then also, in verse 12, we read, and Joseph nourished his father and his brothers and all his father's household with bread according to their families. Look at verse 27. And Israel... That is, Jacob and his family dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions therein, and grew and multiplied exceedingly. By contrast, Egypt's, the Egyptians' condition was dire, but God still used Joseph to, pre, to preserve them. Look at verse 13. And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan failed by reason of the famine. And then it goes into greater detail in the verses following down through to verse 26. But I do want to say, all of this that is happening is really the beginning of the fulfillment of the covenant that God made with Abraham. You remember what he said? He said, Abraham, I want you to leave your home country. I want you to go to a land that I'm going to show you. And I am going to bless you. And I'm going to give you many descendants. And you and your descendants are going to be a blessing to all the families of this earth. Well, this is beginning to shape up. This is beginning to be fulfilled. And this chapter written by Moses originally. This chapter, I think, is a great reminder for Moses' readers and also an encouragement to them about what God's intention is for the people of Israel. And when I think of that, I also think of this. If you are a believer today, you are part of this new covenant, even as a Gentile believer. 
You are the recipients of the covenant that God made there with Abraham uh, through his people because if you're a new covenant believer, you've been grafted in to this covenant that God made with Abraham in a spiritual sense. And you have thus the same responsibility that God meant for the Jewish people originally. And that is that you and I who are new covenant believers grafted in are to be, are blessed by God so that we can be a blessing to both Jew and Gentile ourselves. So that we can bless them, so that we can bless others. You know what? Your purpose is, if you are a believer in Jesus, you know what your purpose is? It's very simple. You're to partner with God to see that His purpose in this earth gets done. It's no more difficult than that. It's no more complex than that. Your purpose as a believer is simply to become a partner with God that his purpose is served, is completed, is finished on this earth. And I want to show you how that can apply in this 47th chapter as we look at Joseph and uh, his dealings and the blessing that he really was uh, and the blessing that Jacob actually became to Pharaoh himself. It's amazing. You remember Jacob? He's always trying to steal a blessing. Now he's giving out blessings at the end of his life. Something's changed in this man. Something changed for the better. Let's pause a moment and pray. Our Heavenly Father, I'm just very thankful to have the scripture today. I'm thankful that we can look into it. And I know that you have something specific for every single listener. So I pray that we wouldn't miss it. We'd hear what it is you have to say to us. Lord, save the lost. Sanctify your people. We're just thankful for what you've done, will do. We take our help and our enablement from you and look to you and depend upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. In the first six verses, uh, there is something that is very distinctive about the people of Israel. In fact, we've already read it, so I don't feel like we need to read it all again, but uh, I did mention to you in that sixth verse as we've uh, read it together that the specific spot that God was going to have Jacob and his family live in, remember there's about 70 of them total, was a place in Egypt called Goshen. Later on in the same chapter, it's referred to as Ramses, the, the city. But one reason, and I think a main one, one reason that God chose Goshen to be the place where he would settle uh, Jacob's family in Egypt is to separate them from the rest of the Egyptians so that he could maintain the family's distinctiveness. He wants them to be distinguished in that way. In fact, it's even clearer when you understand, as is uh, mentioned in the latter part of chapter 46 that we looked at last week, and the first part here of chapter 47, that the Egyptians had a great disdain for shepherds. They disdained shepherds. And that was actually a good thing for Jacob and his family because they were shepherds. And so as a result of that, their distinction from the Egyptians would actually be protected because the Egyptians wouldn't want much to do with them. The Egyptians would want to stay away from them. The Egyptians looked down on them. And so that's actually a plus for them being distinguished and be able to maintain their distinctiveness. As a result, they'd really get Goshen, the best part of the land of Egypt, to themselves. They'd have it all for themselves. And yet, you know, when you uh, look at what uh, Pharaoh says in verse 6 to Joseph, he says, hey, you know, if any of your brothers or any of your family uh, would fit in here in the, uh, in the government system, hey, I'll use them. Uh, 
wasn't God's choice to put these men in the fast lane, so to speak, uh, of Egyptian life. He separates them from that. He distinguishes them. And I can't think about that without realizing that God intends for believers to be distinct. God wants believers to live lives that are different from other people around them. Would you, just for a, mo a moment, keep your finger there and go with me for a moment to the Gospel of John, chapter 17, and let's listen in to some of the requests that Jesus makes in prayer to his heavenly Father just before he heads to Calvary. Because in this 17th chapter, you see the intention of God for his people to be so distinct from the rest of the world, different from the world. Look, we are not meant to think like the world. We are not meant, obviously, then to act like the world. We are to not be fashioned by the thinking processes of this world. In fact, we are told that as the recipients of God's grace, the grace of God will instruct us to live godly and righteous in this present age. And that our overall outlook ought to be not myopic on this life, but rather looking for the soon return of our great God, the Savior, the Lord Jesus. In John 17, notice the prayer of our Lord. In the sixth verse, uh, for example, of John 17, as he prays, he says, Father, he said, um, I've manifested your name to the men which you've given me out of this world. Thine they were, and thou hast given them me. Notice that. If you're a believer, you are out of this world. In the sense that, as a believer, you are a gift. You are a gift from the Father to his Son, the Lord Jesus. That's what that verse teaches. Jesus recognized that, and on that basis he prayed. And he, he says that we are out of this world. We are taken out of this world. We are God, God's gift to his Son out of this world. Notice verse 11 as he prays. And now I am no more in the world... But these are in the world, and I come to thee. He's ready to go back, right, to his Father. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Not only as a believer are you out of this world, but you are kept in this world. It's been said, and here it's clear, that the believer is in the world, but he is not of the world, in answer to Jesus' intercession. Notice verses 15 and 16. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Literally, that word evil refers to Satan. It should be, in one sense, the evil one. Verse 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So we are out of the world, we are kept in this world, we're kept from this world. The Father makes sure that that happens because in answer to Jesus' prayer, verse 17, he says, sanctify them, set them apart, keep them distinct. Make them distinguished and distinctive. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so in answer to Jesus' prayer, the Father sanctifies you and I. He sets us apart. He distinguishes us. He makes us distinctive through the word of God. You, ne you neglect the word of God. You neglect your distinguished. You, you neglect your distinctiveness. And then one more thing that really sets us apart from the world. Look at verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. See how distinguished we are? We're out of this world. 
even though we're in this world, we're out of this world. We're kept. We're preserved while we're in this world. And here we are sent into this world. Isn't that amazing? Verse 18, Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit. In the 20th chapter, he brings on the disciples and he says, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. And they receive the indwelling Spirit at that point. They receive the Spirit's life. They receive God's life. And as a result of that, they're able to love. Distinguished. Just like Joseph's family was to be distinguished in the midst of Egypt. Believers are to be distinct in this world. Don't play with the world. Don't let the world muddy the waters. Don't let the world dilute your testimony. Don't let the world press you into its mold. Don't let the world shape you into its ugly shape. Be distinguished. And then there's a, a, a second thought that I want to share with you this morning from this 47th chapter. And that is that not only was Joseph and his family distinguished, but they were blessed. They were blessed. And how we know that is because of the prosperity that God gave to them in that land. They're blessed. Uh, they're blessed in, in, in really a singular way. Uh, again, verse 27 that I've already read, that they, they gathered, they had great possessions in Goshen, and they grew and multiplied exceedingly while they, were, while they were living there. They were blessed. But that's not where it ends, folks. And this really, I think, is the, the centerpiece of all that I want to say today. And that is this, that they were blessed so that they could be a blessing. In fact, you see this patriarch, Jacob, pronouncing a blessing, perhaps praying for king of Egypt, Pharaoh, praying for him at the beginning of their meeting, their interview, and then praying for him at the end before he left. Two times he blesses the king of Egypt in this uh, meeting that they have. Jacob blesses Pharaoh, and as a result, you read, and through Joseph's wise administration, the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, he prospers greatly during these awful years of severe famine. As a result of Jacob's blessing, Pharaoh prospers under Joseph's administration. And uh, when it's all said and done, all of the Egyptians credit Joseph with rescuing them from death, with preserving them from starvation. And uh, I think uh, if you want to see that for yourself, look at verse 25 once again. They say, the Egyptians say, Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in, thy, in the sight of my Lord. We will be Pharaoh's servants. Look, whatever you say, it's fine. You are our rescuer. You're the one that preserves. We die if we don't listen to you. What a place of blessing God put him in. And again, this is the beginning of the fulfilling of the Abrahamic covenant. It's God's blessing to the Gentiles through Abraham's seed. And it's important for us, it's important for us to realize that that truth is unchanging truth. You know, there's coming a day in the future when Israel will once again bring worldwide blessing to this earth. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 11, and he gets it from the Old Testament prophets, that there is a day in the future when Israel is brought back into a right relationship with her God, when she receives Messiah, when she says, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, when Jesus the Messiah returns the second time, they'll recognize him for who he is. And when that happens, the Bible says... Israel will be restored 
and it will be like life from the dead and blessing will span the globe. So it's an unchanging truth, but let me make the application to you that are new covenant believers and grafted into this Abrahamic co covenant in a spiritual sense. God always blesses his people so that they can be a blessing to others. God's blessing isn't doled out to us so that we can selfishly keep it to ourselves. If we are not being a blessing to people all around us, we've missed our calling. We've misunderstood the blessing of God. We're living very self-centered and very selfish lives if we're not. God blesses his people so his people can be a blessing to others. We ought to be making our song every day, Make me a blessing everywhere I go. And there are two main ways in which God wants to make us a blessing as his people. Number one, he wants to make us a blessing by our lip, by our speech, by what we say. Jacob was a blessing to the king of Egypt by the words that he spoke to Pharaoh or that he prayed over Pharaoh. Those words were significant to that king. And they were fulfilled by the grace of God. And you and I who are believers possess the greatest blessing that God gives, and that's the gospel. And that's what every human being needs more than anything else. More than you need a stimulus check, you need the gospel. Your stimulus check probably won't even get you through the next couple of months, let alone the rest of your life. But what happens after this life ends? What kind of stimulus do you have then? What guarantees are in place then? You see, so God has blessed us by giving us the gospel. And the gospel is the way that we most significantly bless people all around us. So don't ever be intimidated. Don't ever be intimidated by anyone's status. Here's simple Jacob. And he is giving God's blessing to the king of Egypt, the most powerful nation in that ancient world at the time. Don't be intimidated by anyone's status. Share the gospel with them, no matter how big they might seem. Don't be and don't be ashamed of presenting Jesus to people, whoever they are. They need him. You have to see their need. You have to see them through spiritual eyes. It doesn't matter if they gain the whole world. If they lose their own soul, what does it profit them? And so we have a blessing. The greatest blessing, the gospel. And we can't be silent about that. We can't be tight-lipped about that. We have to speak it. The gospel is a message. It's something to be verbalized. And that's why God gave us a mouth. And that's why you have two lips. And that's why you have a tongue. So that you can speak the gospel. Don't be tight-lipped. Another way that we are a blessing to others is not only by our, our lip, but by our life. And really, your life is the basis, it's the foundation, it's the credentials for opening your mouth and letting your lips speak, is your life. Joseph, through his deeds for others, was a blessing. And God's people, believers, are people who are blessed and uh, anyone that is around them is blessed by their lifestyle. Is blessed by them. We're blessed by God so that we can have ministry. You know what ministry is? It's serving other people. That's all it is. We are blessed so that we can serve others. We, uh, we, we place others before ourselves. That's how we bless them. And we look out for others' best interest before we worry about our own best interest. That's unselfishness. That's a blessing. That's how you bless people. God blesses you 
so that you can be a channel of his blessing to everyone around you, to others. And if that's not happen happening in your life, then you're selfishly storing up God's blessing for yourself. Remember the song we sang? Make me a blessing. Is that really what you want God to do? Or do you just say, Lord, bless me. <laughs> do you want simply God to bless you? Or are you wanting God's blessing so you, he can make you a blessing to everyone around you? That's the goal. That's really what make me a blessing is a... The, the, the second stanza of that song we just sang a few minutes ago. Tell the sweet story of Christ and his love. Tell of, the, of his power to forgive. Others will trust him if only you prove true every moment you live. Make me a blessing. That requires a life that has credentials that is able to show the blessing of God. And you know what? You'll never be a blessing to others if you don't walk very close with the Lord. It requires a close walk with Him. It requires intimate fellowship with Him. And you know what happens when you get close to the Lord? You know what happens? He begins to develop and produce in you and through you His love, the fruit of the Spirit. You become burdened for other people. You begin to care and have compassion for others like you wouldn't have naturally. That's what happens when you walk close with the Lord, when you come into intimacy with Him. You begin to stop looking and caring about yourself so much, and you begin to care about others. And if all you are concerned about, basically, is yourself and, and uh, your little family, guess what? You're not walking close with the Lord, I'll guarantee it. I'll guarantee it. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one for another. And if you have love one for another, it's because you're walking close with your lover, and that is the Lord. And when you walk with him, his love will be just poured into your soul, and it will overflow to others. Make me a blessing. And then there's a third thing that uh, ends this chapter, and we didn't read these verses. So uh, we'll probably end up doing that. But verses 27 to uh, 31 really are the verses I'm thinking about. Remember this. Joseph was 17 years old when his dad sent him to check on his brothers. And his brothers, with their envy and their hatred for him, captured Joseph and then ended up selling him as a slave uh, to a traveling uh, merchant caravan that took him and sold him as a slave in Egypt. 17 years, so Jacob had his favorite son at that time. He had his favorite son for the first 17 years of Joseph's life, and then he was taken from him. Here we are in chapter 47, and now what is going to begin, though Jacob doesn't know the extent of it, is the last 17 years of Jacob's life. So in the final years of Jacob's life, he once again has his son. He had him for the first 17 years of Joseph's life, and now he's going to have him for the last 17 years of his own life. Now, look at verse 27 and 28. And Israel, that's the name that God gave Jacob. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had a lot. They had possessions therein, and they grew and multiplied exceedingly, and Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the whole age of Jacob was 147 years. He got there when he was 130. He died at 147. And the time drew near that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said to him, Joseph, and he said, If I have found grace in your sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, deal kindly and truly with me, and bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. But I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt, and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. 
he swore by oath. And he said, swear unto me, he swear unto him, and Israel bowed himself upon his bed's head. A couple of things I want to say about this. Here he is, at the end of his life, basically. And he is a man that is still focused. He's focused. Now in his final 17 years of his life, but yet the, the best ever life that he's had so far. They're all back together. He's right with, uh, they're all right with each other. They're prospering as we read in verse 27. But he has remembered the covenant that God made with his forefathers. And he wants to return back to Canaan because he knows that Canaan is at the center of it. If God's plan is not at the center of your thought and your life, you are going to forget about his promises. You and I need to stay focused on God's purpose for our life. And what is it? To partner with God to see his purpose done on this earth. Our life purpose is to partner with God to see that his purpose is done on this earth. If you don't keep God at the center, you're going to forget that. You need to stay focused because God wants you to be that one that he can channel his blessings through, right? He wants you to be a blessing. And if you lose your focus, if God's, not, uh, if God's plan isn't the center of your life, you're going to forget. You're not going to be focused. You're going to forget. And you're going to spend your life enamored with Egypt's stuff, with earthly things. And you're going to chase worldly success and, and your life won't be concerned with the things that are above, with the heavenly things, with the things that really count, that really matter. So, don't forget. This man, Jacob, was focused. He didn't forget because he was a man of faith at this point. Here's this oath that he wants his son, Joseph, to swear by to bury him not in Egypt but in Canaan so that a message to his descendants would be recognized that the promise of God and the blessing of God involves a specific place for Israel and that is the land of Canaan and so we're not going to settle here in Egypt permanently we're not here uh, indefinitely and for him to think like that and to speak that way and to demand that kind of, of oath from his son meant that he was a man that had faith. Despite his circumstances, he was believing that God was going to do what God told him he was going to do. And Joseph agreed, as you saw here when we read it. And as a result, Jacob worshipped. It says... And Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. Actually, it's probably uh, an, uh, an alternate translation that he bowed himself upon his staff. And Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 21 presents Jacob as a man of faith right at this point in his life. Look at By faith Jacob, when he was dying blessed both the sons of, of Joseph and worshipped leaning upon the top of his staff. You know what that staff represented, right? <laughs> represented everything that, that, uh, that his life was about. And he's worshipping. Here he is really showing himself by faith. I depended upon God to fulfill his promises regarding the land of Canaan, though it hasn't happened yet, and it's not going to happen for another 400 years plus. But I believe it, so I'm going to worship God now. Faith, trust, dependence upon God always leads to worship of God. If it doesn't, it's not genuine faith. Real faith. Belief, real dependence on God will lead you to worship because you'll just be amazed at how faithful he is. Have you ever seen maybe uh, a television program where they have a grocery store contest 
where they give a couple of people uh, an allotted amount of time where they can grab anything and everything they want, put it, fill up their grocery cart to overflowing, but it's only a certain amount of time, and uh, and they, they get to keep for free whatever they, they uh, can stuff in that cart. Well, I'll tell you what, I thought about that. If I ever was in a contest like that, I wouldn't go for the popcorn and the chips and the soda. I'd go for the prime, you know, steaks. I'd go for the lobster. I'd go for the jumbo shrimp. Where's Warren today? Where's Warren when I need him? I'd go for the haagen -Dazs. And I'd fill my cart with the, with the most expensive stuff in that grocery store, you know. You don't know how much more time you have left to live. Obviously the clock's ticking. And you're spending your time doing things and getting things. And when the clock finally stops on your life, will your cart be full of things that really don't matter? Things that are worthless? Trivial stuff that won't count for eternity? What are you stuffing in your cart? Your virtual cart on Amazon, as well as the grocery cart, right? This is what Jesus was talking about in that most familiar verse, where he's talking about our lives in that Sermon on the Mount, and he says, he says, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Seek first the kingdom and God's righteousness. And guess what? All your needs will be met. Not all your wants, but all your needs will be met. Everything you have need of. If you will put God first, you don't have to worry about working yourself sick. He gives His beloved sleep. The Bible says. That's people that are resting, that are depending upon Him. They're doing their part, but they're depending upon Him. They're not going nuts because they're seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, trusting that everything they need is going to be supplied by Him. You know, you might be listening this morning and you may have never trusted Christ as your Savior. And I don't know about your life, Maybe you're happy with your life without Jesus. Or maybe you're very unhappy if you're really, if you're really honest. Regardless, someday you're going to stand before this Lord. You're going to stand before God and all the stuff that you've accumulated and all the good things that you think you've done are going to prove to be absolutely worthless. Absolutely worthless. You will never be able to balance the scales. Because all of that stuff that you think is good, that is balancing the scales, is like chaff to the Lord. It's weightless. It's nothing. He doesn't count it. In fact, Jesus gives that great illustration in Luke chapter 12. He said there was a rich man. He was greatly prospering. In his society, he would be right up there you know, with the, the biggest earners. He had so much stuff that he didn't know what to do with it all. He had to build warehouses just to store it. And he was thinking, this rich man, he was thinking, oh wow, you know, I have nothing to worry about. I got all this stuff and, and I'll never run out. <laughs> and I've got a good retirement plan as, as well. And, if, and Jesus used that illustration and he said, you fool. You are so short-sighted. Your soul is going to be required of you this night. And then what good is this stuff? And then the point Jesus made was this. So is he, so is he that is not rich unto God. So is he that has put his focus on this life and earthly things and earthly success and uh, earthly satisfaction and doing what you think you need and not keeping God and his things 
in focus. You know, if we really believed these verses, these simple verses that I've just shared with you, if we really believed that, I guarantee you we wouldn't be living the way we're living most of the time. We really would be living for things above and not things on this earth. And guess what? We would really uh, also know that we are not missing out on anything by being a believer focused on the Lord and His things. But we're really gaining for all eternity. So Heavenly Father, I pray that if there be lost people that never have trusted You or perhaps some that aren't sure that they would uh, make sure today that they would trust You today and have eternal life. And those of us who know You, Lord, we want to be a blessing. That's what we're here for. We're not here to accumulate. We're here to give. We're not here to gather. We're here to give. And so I pray that we will take all that you have blessed us with and use it to be a blessing to others, especially when it comes to serving them through the gospel. If you don't know the Lord is your Savior, you're either listening in or you're here today. I, just, I don't want you to perish. I don't want you to be like that rich man whose soul was required and he wasn't prepared that day, that night. If you need to trust Jesus as your Savior, why don't you do it right now? Why don't you admit to him that you're a sinner and you're on your way to hell without any hope and realize and... and uh, Thank God that Jesus already took your hell for you. He took your punishment. And why don't you invite him to, right now, be your Savior and forgive your sin. Just ask him, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Lord, I know that I deserve your judgment. But God, I believe that Jesus took my punishment on the cross and I'm trusting him as my personal Savior. If you're a believer, wake up. Wake up. Stop living for this life. Stop living for this world. Start focusing and, and, and depending upon things that are going to count for eternity. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Will you? Live as if you mean it. Make your watchword, Lord, make me a blessing. Make me a blessing.